السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين ونصلي ونسلم على أفضل الخلق أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We commence by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sending complete blessings and salutations upon all the messengers who were sent from the time of Adam, may peace be upon him, going down through to the Prophet Abraham, may peace be upon him, Ishaq and Ismail, may peace be upon them, the Prophet Yaqub or Jacob, Joseph and all the messengers who had come, including Moses and Jesus, Musa alayhi salatu was salam, Jesus may peace be upon him, Isa alayhi salatu was salam, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the final of all these messengers. And we ask the Almighty to bless all their companions and those who sacrificed with them in a way that the goodness was preserved and delivered to us. And we ask the Almighty to bless every single one of us and to grant us goodness and to keep us on the pure path and to keep us from those who have contentment in this world and who shall be from amongst those who have happiness in the life after death. Beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, it is indeed an honor to be here this evening. The topic of discussion that I was given is what is Islam all about? And I will dive straight into the topic, speaking about the pillars of Islam and Iman. But firstly, to tell you what is the meaning of Islam? Islam has a dual meaning. The first is submission and the second is peace. The idea is when you submit, you attain peace. Submit to what? Submit to revelation of your maker. We believe that we were created, the first of our species was known as Adam, may peace be upon him, and the second was known as Eve or Hawa, may peace be upon her. And we believe that the Almighty created us with a purpose. What is this purpose? He says it in the Quran. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created mankind or jinn kind except so that they may worship me. One may misunderstand this and think that worship me refers to constant prayer or refers to constantly being in the remembrance of the Almighty as in verbal remembrance. That is not what is meant here. That is part and parcel of it. But constantly being conscious of the fact that you are returning to your maker and whatever you do should be within what makes the maker happy. Someone made me. And what do I call him? Very interesting, very important. He is my maker. I owe him my worship. And I owe him my existence. I owe him everything. So what should I call him? I need to call him something. So in the Hebrew language, he is referred to as Elohim or Eloha. In the Arabic language, Allah, derived from Aliha, Ya'lahu, which means to worship. So Allah means the worshipped one. So when we say Allahu Akbar, we are saying the worshipped one is the greatest. One might ask you, who is the worshipped one? The answer is in the first verse of the Quran. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin All praise is due to Allah. Who is He? Lord of the worlds. The term used is Rabbun. Rabb is a very short Arabic term, but it refers to something very large very big it has a deep meaning it means creator nourisher cherisher sustainer provider protector curer one who is in absolute control of every aspect of existence we call him rabbun and he is the worshipped one so the one whom i'm going to return to i call him allah the worshipped one i have no risk in worship i don't worship a stick or a stone or a tree or a grave or a saint or a prophet acts of worship are only rendered to whoever made you hence i will put my head on the ground five times a day several times during those five times for who for the one who made the same head and the face the one who gave me a unique identity the one who has given me my thumbprint and my iris allahu akbar 
So I put my head on the ground for him alone. That which is the highest part of my body, I will drop it right to the ground for the one who made it, saying, Subhana Rabbi Al A'la, glory be to you, my maker, nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider, protector, curer, the one whom I'm going to return to, the one who is in absolute control of every aspect of my existence, for indeed you are the highest. That's what I say. That's the, the meaning of the term, Subhana Rabbi Al A'la. When I put my head on the ground, it's the plug in direct, me and my maker. That's it. And this is the beauty of Islam. This is what we need to know. Who is Allah? Some people say, well, you know, he must be one of the idols that was left on the Kaaba. No way. Not at all. Some might say, why do you face the black box? We don't worship it at all, my brothers and sisters. Not at all. We respect it solely because it is there for direction. Nothing else. So that a dispute may not arise amongst the members of the nation. Where do we face? A rich man might say, my home, I have gold plates there. By the way, we're not allowed to use gold and silver utensils. I have gold plates in my home. I think I'd better build the mosque facing my home. And the other say, no, no, no. We have a country further down. Indonesia has the most number of Muslimin, mashallah. So let's face Indonesia. No. In order to solve the matter, resolve it, Allah decides you will face Mecca. There we are. Prior to that, you would face Jerusalem. So it is not because we worship Jerusalem or Mecca or worshipped it. No, it is solely to create uniformity and so that there will be no dispute amongst the Ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. And this is why if you're not sure where Mecca is and you happen to be somewhere, your duty is to try. And if you have prayed facing in the opposite direction by mistake, your prayer is still valid for as long as it was an error. And that goes to show we don't worship the box. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. One might ask, why do you circumambulate that box in an anti-clockwise motion? We will say we join the rest of the creatures of the Almighty, the planets and everything else which move in that rotation and we become one of those who do what the Almighty instructs us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us acceptance. We need to be in sync with the rest of the creatures of the Almighty. So Islam to submit. When you submit, you achieve contentment. Naturally, you will have to have many rules and regulations to achieve contentment. One of the biggest issues that are raised today or the issues that have been raised today, the issue of a woman covering herself modestly. Islam has defined what modesty is. And at the same time, it is for a reason. You will achieve greater happiness and contentment in your home, your life. Those who are attracted to you will be attracted for the right reasons, not for the wrong reasons. It won't take you half an hour to tug up before you greet someone at your door. No, you're a Muslim. You get up and people will judge you not because of the shape you have, a figure like a trigger. No, that's not what people will judge you for because tomorrow when you give birth, the trigger might be pulled. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> May Allah grant true beauty to our sisters. I mean. So this is why my brothers and sisters, Islam asks you to dress in a way that those who are attracted to you would be attracted for the right reason, for who you are, what you stand for, the sacrifice, the sincerity, the heart that lies within. Because if people love you for what you look like, they have loved you for what is on you. What is on you may depart. Then they will look for someone else who has what you had. And then the marriage breaks. And if they married you for your wealth or your car or your accessories or your watch or your phone, and if that was cool and that's why they were attracted to you, they are the most foolish people because they've been attracted to that which was not on you, but which was around you. So they've married your surroundings. That's what has happened. And the day that disappears, wow, they're looking for another guy with a Ferrari. Allahu Akbar. May Allah protect us. I come from a city known as Harare, but there's no Ferraris there. Don't worry. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, what we need to realize, you marry someone for what lies within. Character and conduct develops. Spirituality also develops. As you become older, you become a better person. Does your spouse realize that? Consider that, recognize that, acknowledge that, and appreciate that. If the answer is yes, 50 years later, he says, oh my darling, even the moon looks ugly when you are around. I think some of us will say, it's just a joke. 
he could be serious. Believe me, don't take for granted the statements of your spouses. So in Islam, there is a reason why you need to be dressed in a specific way. We believe we should be dressing similar to the Mother Mary. May Allah's peace be upon her. I did not see her in hipsters and tighties. Not at all. And the images of her were not made by the Muslimin. They were made by others. The same applies to the beard that is grown by the men folk. We are following the example of all the messengers. Not a single messenger. Moses, Aaron, Abraham, Lot, whoever else, David, Solomon, all of them who were the top of the notch, meaning good people, really brilliant people, shining examples, including Jesus, may peace be upon him. All of them had beards. None of them were shaved, not one. So we try to emulate that to the degree that I have been looked at in rural Zimbabwe and they say, has Jesus come? Wow. Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant us goodness. These images were not drawn by us, but it's a reality. So we are living the living example of all the messengers, including the Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him. And in Islam, we firmly believe the more you submit, the more contentment you will taste. May Allah grant us contentment, happiness in this world and the next. So this is the meaning of the term. And I'm sure we would all have learnt that Islam has five pillars. It is built on five pillars. So to put you into the picture, when we talk of the pillars of Islam, we are talking of things that can be seen with the eye. I can tell if people have followed the five pillars of Islam. But there is something known as Iman, which has six pillars and some have taken it to seven. I'll mention them in a few moments. Those pillars cannot be seen. Iman means belief. That's the meaning of Iman. And Islam means submission. So if you have submitted, I can see that. If a person is praying five times a day, one of the pillars of Islam, I can see that. If a person is giving alms to the poor, it's something physical. It can be seen. The poor person knows, or at least they would know, the people around may know. If someone is uttering the declaration of the faith, people would be able, subhanallah, to know that this person has uttered the declaration. Whether they believe it in their hearts or not is between them and the maker. That is known as iman and belief. So this is why the first pillar, the shahada, I, I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides the worshipped one. Who is he? We call him Allah. Now do you know what it means? The worshipped one, one who made me nourish, the one who is in control, nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider, protector, curer, and so on. And I bear witness that all the messengers who have come were upright men, unlike what others believe, that you know, Lot committed this sin, and Solomon did that, and David did this. In Islam, we believe, no, the ambassadors of the Almighty were the most upright in their nation. So we believe they were those who were rightly guided. The Quran says to Muhammad, peace be upon him, those messengers were guided by the Almighty. So you follow the example of their guidance. Amazing. So these were powerful people. Jesus, a powerful man. He was given the miracle by, of the Almighty. So many miracles. The first was his birth. Amazing. He was born through a female without the involvement of a male by the miracle of the Almighty. That's what we believe. Just like Adam, may peace be upon him, was born, or should I say, sorry, was created without the involvement of a male or female. Eve was created through a male without the involvement of a female. Jesus was created through the involvement of a female without that of a male. And all of us, male and female. So these are the five, the, the four probabilities and possibilities that have all been shown to us by the Almighty. May the Almighty grant us understanding. And we believe that we are all part and parcel of the creatures of the Almighty. And we have a role to play as human beings and as creatures of the Almighty. The non-Muslims on the globe today are brothers and sisters of ours in humanity. That is something which means on compassionate grounds, humanitarian grounds, and as human beings who share the ecosystem and who share the globe, we reach out to them and we stand together with them in whatever is required to live on this particular globe. And this is the teaching of Islam. The Prophet, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's peace be upon him, has taught this to us. And he has lived by it. And he has shown that this is the path. Every non-Muslim is looked at by true Islam 
as a potential Muslim, subhanallah. Every non-Muslim is looked at by true Islam as a potential Muslim. So these are some of the miracles that Islam has taught. Amazing. And this is why we say when a person accepts the faith and they understand the five pillars, we see them uttering. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides the worshipped one, Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad, may peace be upon him, is the final messenger and he is the worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they've uttered it. That's one thing. The second, they would pray five times a day. That's a pillar of Islam. One might ask, why do you have to pray five times a day? Well, that's the Almighty. He decided you will get up and breathe fresh oxygen before it's contaminated by the breathing of the others of the same air. Allahu Akbar. You thought of that? Amazing. If you get up, the doctors will tell you that early morning air is so fresh. Well, the hadith says, Bashir al Masha'ina, bi dhulami ila al Masajid, aw fi dhulami ila al Masajid, bi nuri tammi yawm al Qiyamah. Give good news to those who walk out to the mosques in the dark hours of the night of a shining nur or a light on the day of judgment. Believe me, whenever there is benefit of the life after death, there is firstly benefit in this particular worldly life. So if you were to breathe that air whilst you're going to the mosque, or even if you've opened the window and you are actually breathing the early morning air, you will have a much better day than those who have got up late, perhaps from the other side of the bed, as they would say, and you know, groggy, and they don't even know the right from their left sometimes. May Allah protect us. So what a great gift. The timing is perfect. Just before you sleep, there is a prayer. As you get up, there is a prayer. Midday, there is a prayer. Once you've, you know, late afternoon, there is a prayer. And as the sun sets, there is a prayer. Very short. One might ask, is that the real word that you use, prayer? The answer is no. That's just the English what can I say? The English word that is used in order to translate the Arabic known as Salah. Salah is actually what we would term in the English language prayer, but prayer includes supplication as well. So when we say the five daily prayers, we are talking of a specific type of movement with actions and words that are uttered for the Almighty in a specific language. One might ask, why Arabic? I can give you a quick answer. The scriptures that have come from the beginning, we believe in all of them, but where are they? That's the question. I want to see the original manuscript. I had a few people, the Jehovah's Witnesses, who had visited me and they were, you know, preaching the Bible to me. And I asked one question because obviously, you know, I, I, I would salute them for the dedication of trying to go out and preach the faith. And I said, look, is there just one manuscript? They say, no, there are more than 36 different versions of the Bible. So I said, well, if all the Christians can get together upon one version, then I'm sure all the Muslims would accept that version. And they looked at me and said, but that won't happen. I said, well, then you preaching to me. I have a more powerful book that all the Muslims have agreed upon the word of Allah. How did we not lose it? Allah says, we have revealed the book and we are the ones who will protect it. So in order to pray the five daily prayers, what is required for me and you and even the new Muslim, you need to memorize at least a little portion of the book, at least a little portion so that you can be from amongst those who say, I memorized part of the book, even though I may not have understood the Arabic language. So I have contributed towards the protection of the word of the Almighty in the language it was revealed in. Subhanallah. So every one of you seated here, you would be knowing at least a short passage made up of perhaps five lines, ten lines maximum. Perhaps that is the minimum that we would know by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Congratulations, you have contributed towards the protection of the word of the Almighty in the language it was revealed in, even though you may not have understood that particular language, subhanallah. And this is why the word of Allah is memorized by so many people across the globe. It is known by so many people. If I were to make an error, I'm sure there would be so many people here who would be able to correct me. And they would say, no, this is a mistake. And if I were to read a verse, we would all be able to know where exactly it is. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So when you accept Islam or when a person is a Muslim, when we are praying, we stand up facing a specific direction and we would say the worshipped one is the greatest and we would stand folding our hands and at the same time we would be declaring the praise of the Almighty and reading passages of the Quran in a specific language because we need to contribute towards the protection of that book. Subhanallah. Amazing. So the Quran is the book. And these five prayers, if we take a look at them, they are a gift of the Almighty to discipline us. We stand in a specific place. We need to be clean. We need to be wearing a dress code that is covering specific organs and parts of the body. And at the same time, we look at a specific place. So if I can look at one place five times a day without moving my eyes, and I, I don't eat whilst I'm praying and so on, and I can control myself in that, then I can discipline myself outside the prayer and protect my eyes from looking at where I'm not supposed to be looking because I could do this. I've been trained five times a day for the sake of the Almighty, looking at one spot, for example. Why then outside those five prayers can I not, for the sake of the same Almighty, be controlling my gaze? Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to understand the broader benefit of this prayer. Let's move on. If we take a look at supplication, which is to call out to the Almighty, we have no restriction. You can supplicate in any language. In fact, before you utter your words, the Almighty already knows what you want to say. He knows what you want to say even before you've uttered it. Sometimes you want something, you need something, you want to call out to the Almighty, but your words do not really do justice to what you want. And the Almighty says, I know what you want. Don't worry. And this is why you could say, Almighty, every single one of us seated here has different needs, different difficulties, different issues. You know what each one of us wants granted to us. Amen. Amazing. The Almighty, to call out to him in terms of supplication, there is no language restrictions. Before you eat, after you eat, as you're embarking on a journey, when you come back, there may be a preferred set of words because they were uttered by the messengers and so on. But it's not restricted to that. It's not prohibited to say it in English in the name of the Almighty. And it, to pray, to ask and so on by means of supplication, no restriction. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us and may he make it easy for us. So that is the second pillar of Islam. And as I said, if you were to pray, people would see it. If you were not to pray, people would see this person is not submitting. Thirdly, to give out alms to the poor. Alms to the poor, a specific percentage, two and a half percent of your savings and perhaps what you have in gold and silver and perhaps uh, what you have uh, saved, as I said, and you, the cash you may be holding, two and a half percent of it. I'm sure we would know the details, but in a nutshell, there is a small percentage of charity you need to give out on an annual basis for the sake of the Almighty. What he does, he does not want you to cling to materialism. He says, I've given you what you have, two and a half percent of that belongs to me. I would like to give it, I would like you to give it on my behalf to the poor. So that amount does not belong to you, it belongs to him. All you are doing is offsetting it on his behalf. And you don't owe it to the church or the mosque or anyone. No, you owe it yourself. You can go out to the poor and you can hand it to them yourself. Or you can give anyone of your choice who is reliable that amount. It's between you and your maker. Unlike other faiths, sometimes you owe it to the, you know, the priest or the rabbi or whoever else it is in Islam. It's your duty, you and your maker. And on top of that, voluntary charities, no limit to that. May the Almighty accept our charities and may he accept from us that which we give for his cause, bearing in mind that a charity in Islam does not stop at what is monetary. No, but even to smile is a charity. Smile, mashallah. Show your dentures. Uh, sorry, so, sh show your teeth, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Even if you're showing your dentures, it's an act of worship. My brothers and sisters, mashallah, we thank the Almighty. Or should I be more realistic, mashallah? Even if you didn't have teeth, to smile is a charity. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us strong teeth and may he make us chew the right food. I mean. So my brothers and sisters, this is the charity. Then we have a pillar of Islam known as fasting. We fast for many reasons. Do you know today the medical, the medical benefits of all these pillars of Islam are being researched. Amazing how when you put your head down in prostration in salah, you're actually curing yourself of heart disease. Did you know that? It's the only position you can comfortably get into as a human being whereby your brain is lower than your heart. 
Allahu Akbar. And the gravity would actually make it easier for it to pump. And now the oxygenated blood getting to your mind and your brain, you feel fresh and you're okay. And if you're used to praying like that and spending time in prostration for your maker, you find yourself a very healthy person. And if you're not used to it, your head begins to throb initially. Don't worry, get used to it. The throbbing will go. May Allah grant us goodness. May he make us more used to putting our heads on the ground and not just darting ourselves down as though we are chickens pecking the ground for grains. Allah protect us. So if you look at fasting, we fast for the month of Ramadan. Sometimes non-Muslims look at us, you fast for the month, I'll be dead by then. No, it's from dawn to dusk every day. Simple. It has a lot of goodness for your health and spiritually as soon as the month of Ramadan enters, ask the Muslims, they will tell you there is a different spirituality. It is so elevated that you would need to be a submitter in order to feel it. Subhanallah. Amazing. And thereafter, you would have compassion because when you're hungry, you reach out to the poor. You have food you're staying away from. For one month, you're staying away from food and permissible sexual desires and so on within from dawn to dusk. That should help you protect your chastity outside that month. If I could do it for one month, why can I not do it for the rest of the 11 months? Number one. Number two is, if you can protect yourself from eating what is otherwise permissible for one month of the calendar, why can you not protect yourselves from eating that which is prohibited for the rest of the 11 months? Amazing. And thereafter, you would also be able to reach out to the poor. I have food, but I'm not eating it. What about those who don't have the food? So this is why a lot of people tend to give out the charities in the, the month of Ramadan. The hadith says, Kana ajwada ma yakunu fi Ramadan hina yalqahu Jibreel fayudarisuhu al-Quran. The Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, was a very generous man. He was more generous than the wind that would blow. When wind blows, its generosity is such that everyone feels it. So the Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, his generosity was immense and in the month of Ramadan it was even more because the angel Gabriel used to come to him and they used to learn the Quran they used to read the Quran to one another amazing what a beautiful saying of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam thereafter we have the Hajj if you can manage and you are able it's a pillar of Islam why go on the Hajj the reason is the Prophet Abraham was the father of all the prophets who came after him he sacrificed after he knew his maker, he worshipped his maker. If you were to read the verses of the Quran, he identified his maker and he said, I worship whoever created the sun, the moon, the stars, myself and every other aspect of creation. I worship whoever made everything and I know that he is one. Because if there was more than one, they would have had a dispute at least once. No dispute. There is one supreme maker and deity and that is whom I worship and I will put my head on the ground for him. And then Allah spoke to him and Allah says, Oh Ibrahim, we love you. We have taken you as a Khalil, as a very close friend. And then he was given instructions. The Bible makes mention of some of these. The Quran makes mention of some of these. And he was instructed to sacrifice his son. Did that make sense? Listen very carefully. The answer is no. It doesn't make sense to anyone. Sacrifice your son? For what? But because he knew where it came from and the source was my maker, I'm going to do it. Allahu Akbar. And Allah knew that I'm not going to let something of this nature actually happen, but it's just a test. Why was that a test? He, he went forth. His son said, look, if the, the source of this instruction is the maker, then dad, go ahead. You'll find me from amongst those who are patient. Allahu Akbar. And his dad really with tears in his eyes went forth and he was trying to fulfill the sacrifice and the almighty really substituted the child with a ram from heaven. Hence, we have the Hajj. And we would like we go to Mecca. We fulfill what the Prophet Abraham did in a, in a slightly different way in order to commemorate the great sacrifice. But do you know what one of the biggest lessons is? He was ready to fulfill that which did not make sense to him because he knew the source of it. We at times are not ready to fulfill what makes sense to us and we still know the source of it. How can we still call ourselves submitters? Sometimes people might argue, why do I need to cover up? Why do I need to do this? Why do I only need to eat halal? Why do I need to do this and that? Well, the answer is sometimes you may know 
why and sometimes you may have to go out and learn why but in the interim it doesn't mean that you should just abandon it start fulfilling it see you may start achieving the contentment that you are really searching for after fulfilling that which may not have made 100% sense initially but as gradually you worshiped and you followed you it would start making so much sense to you you would feel the comfort you would realize the greatness of it and then you would say subhanallah all praise is due to Allah Look at that, the beauty of Islam. So this is the Hajj. We go and we pelt where the devil was at the time of the Prophet Abraham. May peace be upon him. He's not there right now. So what is the significance of pelting? Uh, when I've been, I've seen people taking slippers and umbrellas and sticks and whacking the pillar saying, Hey, you Satan, come to my life every other day. Today I'm knocking you out. And they start beating. What's the point? You don't take a rock and hit it. Islam teaches you that every one of us has bad habits, bad qualities, some real, some sins that we might be hooked onto and addiction and so on. So as you are pelting, the significance is you say Allahu Akbar, the greatness of Allah is declared and you say whether shaitan likes it or not, here goes. Here goes what? The biggest bad habit I have. One, gone. So what is that? Say for example, adultery, never again. I leave it in Mina, it's gone. The next bad habit, jealousy I have, out, it's gone. The next bad habit, something else, perhaps people who are hooked onto pornography and that is a scourge of the age, gone. What else? Perhaps your envy and maybe you might be a person who might have done something bad. So many bad qualities. We will pelt at least 49 little pebbles within a space of three days. 49 of your major habits out in Mina, when you come back, you're as pure as the day you, you, you were born. Amazing, amazing. So what was the significance of that? I purified myself. I've come back. I spent a night in Mina. I pondered over all my weaknesses. I might have jotted them down. And when I came back after Arafah, I left them in Mina and I came home as clean as the day I was born. Man hajja wa lam yarfath. The hadith continues to say, Raja'aka yawmi waladathu ummuhu. A person who goes for the hajj and he has not engaged in immorality or vulgarity and so on. He's fulfilled it properly, would return as pure as the day his mother gave birth to him. Amazing. So this is the Hajj. So the five pillars of Islam I've spoken about, these are things that you can actually see. When someone utters the Shahada, the declaration of faith, you can see it. People are praying five times a day, you can see it. People are giving alms to the poor, you can see it. People fasting in the month of Ramadan, you can notice. People going on the Hajj, you can see. Something is higher than all this. What is higher than Islam? That which is known as Iman. Iman meaning belief. Now to believe what you've uttered, I believe that Allah is one and Muhammad peace be upon him is the final messenger. That is now a higher level. So if you believe Allah is your maker and he alone deserves worship, you will search your life to make sure that nothing that you do within your life is in transgression to what the Almighty has taught. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. And if you believe that Muhammad was the messenger, may peace be upon him, you would understand that what he brought was a completion of what Jesus came with, what Moses came with, may peace be upon them all. And you would understand the idea of Islam is obedience, submission. And Muhammad, may peace be upon him, has come with that which is very, very similar. In fact, it is a completion, as I said. And he has come to teach us how the Almighty wants to be worshipped. This is why there is something known as an innovation. Innovation means something the messenger did not teach and it is an act of worship. So if you were to look at the light and the roof and the paint and the ceiling and the buildings, that's not a direct act of worship. So innovation does not enter that territory. But if I were to worship the Almighty by saying, okay, I'd like to worship the Almighty, I'll raise my right hand and I'll hold it up towards the sun for 15 minutes and I'll say, God bless me, God bless me, God bless As a Muslim, I'm not allowed to do that because you do not create an act of worship on your own. The messenger's job was to teach me and you how to worship the Almighty. So just go and see what he said. He said, you make so many units, you do this, you do that. Yes, when you want to supplicate, you can raise your hands and supplicate. You can call out to the Almighty at certain times and at any time. Amazing. But to do an act of worship he didn't teach, that is part and parcel of believing in the fact that he was the messenger. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Thereafter you have... Belief in the angels. They are angels. The, the angel Gabriel. Mikael, mashallah. A friend of mine visiting from uh, Malaysia, mashallah, for this function. Uh, Mikael, mashallah. And we said, wow. At least it wasn't, 
you know, the angel of death. Allahu Akbar. Allah grant us goodness. Allah bless us all. So Mikael, an angel. Jibreel, the angel, certain angels mentioned. We know. The Quran has a great description of who the angels are. They do not disobey. They are there for reasons. Every human being is born. They have a soul. The soul is given a uniform. The uniform is known as a body. You will remove the uniform when you go into the life after death. Your uniform is left back and you continue. So the, what, I'm, what I have right now, we call it a body. It's actually a uniform given to the soul in order to test it during its life at this big school known as my life. It's a school. I will graduate one day and what will happen? I need to, inshallah, get my certificate. I'll remove my uniform and I'll come for the graduation and I'll be given my book. That's what it is. So what you are holding now, this body, is a trust entrusted to you. I cannot tattoo it as a Muslim. I cannot cause harm to it. I cannot do whatever I want to it. I can do whatever the Almighty has permitted me to do on this particular body. This is why we need to look after our bodies. We do not consume that which is harmful to the body. People ask about cigarettes. Well, if it's harmful, don't do it. You're a Muslim. People ask about shisha. Wow, the in thing. The shisha lounge, you know, we'll meet there. Yeah, not a problem. It's becoming a big thing. Believe me, if it's harmful to your body, a Muslim should not be there. That's the best way of wording it. Notice I'm not saying it's haram, haram, because we know what it is. But at the same time, I'd rather tell you, you're a Muslim, don't go there. Come on. You know, you, you're harming this uniform of yours. You're burning. Imagine a few days ago, we were here, Tawheedul Islam Girls High School, top school, mashallah. And look at them dressed, speak and span, mashallah. Imagine uniform. And each one is making holes in the uniform and pitch up the next day at school. How? I got a hole. I, got, I, drew, I drew a little cartoon on my uniform. They'll kick them straight out of the school. Come back with a better uniform. And we tattoo our bodies. Allahu Akbar. Muslim, don't do that. May Allah protect us. May He forgive those who may have done it. Remember, you just ask the Almighty for forgiveness and He will forgive you. I need to pause there for a moment. The issue of forgiveness. One of the most powerful gifts of a Muslim your sin is your secret between you and your maker. You don't even confess it to your spouse. Did you hear that? That's Islam. Your sin is your secret. It's between you and your maker. In the darkest corners of the night, you have four conditions. If you meet them, you're as pure as the day you were born. Any day, any time. What are the four conditions? Admit that you were wrong. Regret it. Say, I'm sorry, I ask your forgiveness and promise not to do it again. Wiped out. Between who? You and your maker. No confession to anyone else. That's Islam. This is the beauty of the faith. So no matter what I've done in the past, even if I've done things that are irreversible, you get people who've tattooed, we were talking about it, I'm just going to make mention of it, and sometimes they would regret it later on, and they cannot reverse it for whatever reason it is. Well, you're going to have to live with that, but who knows, the Almighty would have forgiven you because you regretted it and you really don't like what you did. So never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Oh Muhammad, peace be upon him. Tell my worshippers, whoever has transgressed against themselves beyond the limits, that Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. He will forgive all the sins that human beings have engaged in. Let them turn, for indeed they need to turn before it is too late. So turn to the Almighty. I always say, you have a sin, turn now. Here and now, Ya Allah, I'm going to leave this habit, that habit, I regret it, I feel I've done wrong, don't want to do it again, I promise you from this day, I'm going to improve. And you see yourself feeling so good within an instant. Never ever does the Almighty reject your repentance if the four conditions are met. No, He won't reject it. So don't think He's rejecting it. The devil comes to you and makes you think, there's no mercy for you. That's the devil. There is always mercy. So this is the beauty of Islam. This is what Islam is all about. And this is how we are different from other faiths. You do not confess to anyone. You confess to your maker. If you have told someone a sin, you may regret it. You may regret it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. And may he grant us goodness. So we were speaking about belief in the, in the angels. You have aman to billah. I believe in Allah. Believe in the angels. 
wa kutubihi i believe in all the previous scriptures that were revealed to all of them david the psalms the, the, the scriptures of abraham and moses the torah and so on i believe in the injil the bible that was revealed to jesus all these books we believe in them if the original manuscripts were here today we would have to submit to them because they would conform to what has come in the quran we believe they've been lost they've been changed that's what we believe so we are not allowed to base our whole life on something that is debated something that people are not sure whether it's authentic or not i live once if i live once i, I cannot risk that life i need to make sure it's based on something real so i will worship my maker alone I will never put my head down on the ground for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or the Prophet Jesus, may peace be upon him. But I will put my head on the ground for the maker of Jesus and Muhammad, may peace be upon them all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Muhammad, may peace be upon him, never ever said, worship me. We believe the Quran says, Jesus, may peace be upon him, never ever said, worship me. He said, worship my maker. Worship God above, worship my maker, the one and only. That's what we believe. The Quran has said it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So we believe in all the scriptures, kutubihi, the scriptures of Allah. And we believe the Quran is the only authentic scripture. And, this, and it is the final book. And in it, there is a sharia. There is a set of code or should I say conduct and rules and regulations that we will abide by. So one might ask, well, your laws are slightly different from the Jewish laws. Let me explain to you very briefly. When it comes to rules and regulations of how to lead your life, it changes with the changing of time and each messenger came with something slightly different. But when it comes to belief, it was always the same. Every messenger taught that there is one God and the angels and the books, good and bad fate comes from the Almighty. You're going to die. There's going to be resurrection. There is heaven and hell. Every single messenger taught the same message in terms of belief. So don't think that the message is different between Jesus and Moses and Aaron and Abraham and the others and Adam and Noah. No, it was all the same. They all taught there is a life after death, responsibility, answerability to the Almighty. There will be a day of resurrection. You're going to die one day and so on and so forth. All this belief was the same, completely the same. When it comes to matters of leading life, how to pray differed with a different times and so on different prophets and messengers some of the rules and regulations regarding dietary restrictions and so on changed with the changing of time it is known as sharia sharia meaning the law that will govern how you lead your life that will change with the changing of time so muhammad sallallahu was sent the quran which has two things in it in this regard one is belief and one is the sharia in terms of law rules and regulations so the rules and regulations are there and the belief is exactly the same that you will find from the time of the beginning of creation. May the Almighty grant us a deep understanding. So these are the books, the Quran being the final book. And we believe it has not been changed at all, at all. It's the word of Allah. Read it, understand it. It is your gift. It is the most powerful word in existence at the moment. Believe me, try it out. Listen to it, read it and open your heart and mind as a Muslim, as a non-Muslim. You will find much comfort in this heavenly book. It is the word of your maker, Allahu Akbar. And he talks to you. He speaks to you. It is totally different from the Bible and the other books. Because the way it is put forth, you will see very clearly. This is the speech of the Almighty talking to myself and yourselves. May he grant us strength. Then you have the messengers. As I said, we believe in all of them. Every single one of them we believe in. Jesus, may peace be upon him, he had a miraculous birth. As I said, we believe he was not known as the son of the Almighty, but rather the messenger created miraculously without the interference or involvement of a male. And at the same time, we believe he was not crucified. We believe he was taken up to heaven before he was harmed by the Romans. And we believe that the traitor who wanted to hand him into the Romans was the one whose face was changed to his face and he was the one crucified yet Jesus may peace be upon him was protected by the Almighty raised up to the heavens in his form and life that he had in the world and he is alive today and he shall return towards the end of time that is Jesus may peace be upon him 
And this is what we believe about him. Amazing. And we believe he had miracles. The Quran makes mention of how by the will of the Almighty, the Almighty gives this power to, to his messengers. He could cure those who were sick and ill by merely passing a hand over them. He could create a little bird-like structure made of clay and he would blow on it and it would begin to fly. A little bit of food would be sufficient for a lot of people. It's a miracle of the Prophet Jesus. These are mentioned in the Quran. And guess what? They're mentioned in the Bible as well. Amazing. So we also believe of the miracles of Jesus, but we say we worship the Lord of Jesus. We don't say Lord Jesus. We say the Lord of Jesus. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. If I were to say, oh Moses, cure me. Do I know that Moses owns cure? It's a risk. Some might say, yes, he does. And the Muslims will say, no. So there is a debate about it. If I were to say, oh Jesus, cure me. Some people would say, yes, he would. And others will say, no, he won't. So there is a question mark. Why risk? If I say, oh Muhammad, cure me. Some might say he will. And some will say he won't. Risk. Why do that? Oh, owner of cure, cure me. Can anyone say you're wrong? Oh, owner of cure, cure me. Can anyone say you're wrong? Oh, you who made me, oh, you whom I'm going to return to, have mercy upon me. The day I return to you, that is Islam. Allahu Akbar. Oh, you who is going to be in control of my existence in the grave and thereafter, have mercy on me the day I die and help me through getting through the other side. Allahu Akbar. That is Islam. This is why we have so many names and qualities of the Almighty. It's a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amazing. How many of us don't even know the power of the religion, the power of the deen. We worship Allah alone and we should understand and realize when we say Allah, we're talking of the worshipped one, the one who made me, the one in whose hands cure lies. So I say, O oh, owner of cure, O oh, you who hears my prayer, hear my prayer. O oh, you who answers the call, answer me. Allahu Akbar. No risks involved. I'm living once. I'm not prepared to risk anything. I'm not going to say, Oh Muhammad, cure me. Oh Jesus, cure me. Oh Moses, cure me. Because I believe, Oh owner of cure, cure me. Oh you who made me, grant me. And so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and may He make us from those who understand and realize. Now, if we move further, we will notice when we speak of the messengers of the Almighty, there is a fine line between worship and respect. We respect them right to the limit of respect, but we do not render a single act of worship for any messenger. So we will send blessings and salutations upon the messenger and the messengers, and we will pray for them. And we will, uh, there are so many words of praise we may utter regarding them and so on, but we will never ever render an act of worship for anyone besides he who made me, because that's why he made me. He would like to see who has better deeds. He says in the Quran, Surah Al-Mulk, الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا. He has created death and life in order to test you who has better deeds. So I'm in competition with you, and you are in competition with me. But the reality is, all of us can achieve the same rank. I need to do good deeds. Allah says, وَفِي ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافَسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ You want to compete about something? Instead of competing who has a greater salary and who has a better car and a better home and you know, uh, much more in terms of material enjoyment in this world. Instead of competing for that, compete for the pleasure of the Almighty. And you see what you will get. Because money does not buy everything. Money will never buy you contentment. It won't even buy you your sleep let alone contentment. May Allah grant us good sleep and may He grant us contentment. I don't mean fall off to sleep here and now, but inshallah later on this evening. So, we believe there is a fine line between worship and respect. So we will respect and we know that worship is only for the Almighty. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Let's move to the next pillar of Iman. So we said, wa malaikati wa kutubihi we believe in the books, the angels, the prophets. We believe there is a last day, a day when everything will come to an end besides what the Almighty wants. And we believe there is a judgment after that, resurrection after that, and the Almighty will judge between us. So let's not be very judgmental between ourselves. The Almighty has set aside a whole day, which is equivalent to five to 50,000 
years of this life. Amazing. He has set aside a long day to judge between people. Why do we then assume his role and start saying, heaven, hell, heaven, hell, for what? Does it belong to you? It doesn't even belong to you. So who are you to judge and to decide where people are going? Come on. You might have a weakness that is apparent to everyone. Or that person might have a weakness apparent to everyone and you might have 10 weaknesses that are hidden and far worse. Allah alone knows. So learn to love one another for the pleasure of the maker. That's Islam. And one thing that's important to know about Islam, never judge a book by its cover. Islam is one of those books that people judge just by the cover. We who are Muslims are very guilty of not portraying the correct image of Islam. So people think it's a religion of fanaticism. It's a religion of terrorism. It's a religion of this and that. Sometimes because of our own deeds and the way we operate, we couldn't even bother to help a person just because they're not a Muslim. And we did not go and search the life of the messenger. His character was such that it left a deep impact in the lives of those who interacted with him to the degree that the bulk of them turned to the faith. Amazing. With us, people who want to come towards Islam turn away from it. This is why I say sometimes we need to ask ourselves, you have not been used to attract people to Islam. But what's worse than that is when you've been used to distract people from Islam. May Allah not make us from amongst those. Think about it carefully. If someone preaches to you and says, you need to frown when you see a non-Muslim, Wallahi, they are talking nonsense. They don't know what they're saying. That's not Islam. Every non-Muslim is a potential Muslim. As I said, they are our brothers and sisters in humanity. And thereafter, perhaps in faith as well. May the Almighty grant us really the true understanding of this deen of Islam, the religion, beautiful faith. So we believe that there will be a day of resurrection when we will get our books, a book of deeds. Each one of us, I can explain to you in a nutshell. We have a soul, the uniform is the body. With that, Allah has appointed one angel who guides us and there is a Satan that comes to misguide us. So every time as you attain puberty, every time there is something bad to be done, the angelic force within you will tell you don't do it. And the satanic force will tell you do it. The soul then makes a decision, either this way or that way. Whatever decision is made, that particular force wins. So if I have chosen not to do something bad, following the angelic force within me, in that case, I have become spiritual. I am turning closer. The next time it becomes easier and easier for me to obey, for me to do that which pleases the Almighty, until I'm known as a spiritual person, until my spirituality can be felt, because I am actually a person whom it's so easy for me to get up for my prayers, perhaps to be an honest person, good character, because I'm used to it. To abstain from anger and temper, which is an Islamic teaching to abstain from. So if I forced myself to abstain from it the first time, second time, 20 times, by the time I get to 25 times, I won't need to really force myself. It will be my nature. It becomes your nature. But if you've allowed the devilish force or the satanic force to win once, so when there was alcohol to be consumed, what happened? You just went ahead and drank it. The first time you might have regretted it. Oh, adultery. Wow, I don't know what I gained by that. The second time, felt it again, guilt. Third time, no guilt. Fifth time, tenth time, well, it was nothing to you. It was just like saying, hello, Allah protect us. Why? Because the devil has overtaken you. Initially, the Almighty gave you that help and assistance and you chose not to do that. You chose to throw the help away, the guidance away. This is why we say it's up to you to fight off the devilish force. That is the battle. And then when you die, when your uniform is put aside and you go and meet your maker, you will then be able to see the results. But I tell you, it is through the mercy of the maker that we will all enter paradise. May Allah grant that to us. It's the mercy of the maker. No matter what I've done, sometimes my deeds may not be pure enough, good enough for me to enter paradise. Perhaps, maybe, who knows? But the mercy of the maker can make me get there by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we believe there is a day of resurrection. And then there is a pillar of iman and belief where we believe as Muslimin 
in fate. Good and bad fate comes from the Almighty. Destiny is from the Almighty. Whatever I want to achieve, I must try my best within the capacity and means given to me by the Almighty. If I want to get good results, I need to work hard. If I was lazy and then I fail, I'm to blame. But if I work very hard and I still fail, I put my hands down and say the Almighty decreed that. Allahu Akbar. If I was traveling at 200 miles an hour and then I made an accident, whoa, I'm to blame. But if I was going through upon the speed limits and still someone knocked into me and something happened, well, that was decree, destiny. May the Almighty grant us goodness. May He open our doors. So we believe good and bad fate comes from the Almighty. You've lost a loved one. Well, you need to surrender to the fact that that has to happen. You will lose your loved one or they will lose you or both of you may go together. One day you will meet them again somewhere by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is Islam. This is Iman. These are the pillars of Islam and Iman. Moments ago I said some take it to seven pillars of Iman and belief because some separate the last day and the, and the judgment to separate points. But we can bring it to one because it's referring to that which is after death. May the Almighty grant us goodness. A few more pointers important to make mention of. Islam teaches development of character and conduct and gives it preference to the degree that the messenger says. One of the biggest points that will drive the people of heaven into heaven would have been their character and conduct. So if a person is holy, if a person is holy in the wrong way, which means they pray whole day, they read the Quran, they like to, you know, be found in the mosque, they dress appropriately, they are always making mention of good things, but they treat people very, very badly and their character and conduct is unacceptable. In that case, they are minimizing their chances of salvation and goodness. That's what Islam teaches you. Because their good deeds will be given as payment to those whom they've wronged. That's what Islam teaches. And yet when you've developed your character and conduct and you've become a good person with a clean heart, the development of the interior, the removal of qualities like jealousy, hatred, envy and so on and development of selflessness, development of love of one another, love of the creature, of the creatures of the Almighty, all creation and so on. That is what makes a Muslim. And sometimes we become oblivious of this. Sometimes we are guilty, really. We've developed ourselves outwardly, but we've forgotten the inside. So that makes a, a great chunk of a Muslim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to develop ourselves internally as well as externally. Then we have the Sharia I made mention of moments ago. People say, oh, barbaric. You know what? They cut hands, man. And you know what? They do this and they do that. Believe me, the Sharia is a set of laws that is divine. There's no loopholes in it. It's not as barbaric as the media makes it out to be. Not at all. No ways. In fact, it is there to protect five elements to the highest degree. Your brain to be protected and under that what would be prohibited is anything that knocks your head like alcohol intoxicants and so on even oppression you oppress someone to the degree that they are suffering you know getting to insanity and all that totally prohibited because don't play with the brains of people moments ago i was saying a lot of people tell uh you know sometimes nowadays you have people who fake that they love you because the most simplest words i love you oh that's just three sentences you know before we used to see a Rolex, you know, a watch, a, a very expensive watch, say a Swiss watch. And the guy comes to you and says, I can sell you this Rolex for 10 pounds. You say, what? A Rolex for 10 pounds? And then he says, yeah, uh, this one is made in China, you know. You say, but, but it says here, Swiss made, made in Switzerland, Swiss. The guy looks at me and says, if they can make the whole thing in China, the easiest part is to write they're made in Switzerland. The easiest part is to write they're made in Switzerland. The more difficult part was to imitate the whole thing. So with us sometimes, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. We have issues that we need to deal with. See, the Sharia, it protects the human brain. Anything that has to do with taking away the brain is considered unacceptable. Why? That's what makes you different from animals. What makes me different from an animal? The cow. My brain is far more superior. Allah has given this to me. And this is why I need to answer to Allah. So no drinking, no alcohol, no oppression and so on. 
We are not supposed to be engaged in all of this. Point number one. Point number two, the protection of your lineage. Lineage is sacred. The Almighty chooses your father for a reason. You have rights to fulfill and he has rights to fulfill. And it is a test. Your father can be a Muslim or a non-Muslim. They have rights. The Almighty chooses your mother. Your mother has rights and you have rights over her. She can be a Muslim or a non-Muslim. The Almighty chose for you and me. Nobody applied, none of us. No application forms were filled, not at all. Perhaps they may have prayed for you. This is why I always say, your parents, you owe them a lot. You never prayed for them, but they may have prayed to have you. Allahu Akbar. Have you ever thought of that? So if you take a careful look at this, lineage is sacred. So what does it prohibit under that? It prohibits adultery, fornication, you know, uh, the sperm banks and so on. All this is prohibited. To have IVF donations of other people prohibited because it tampers with your lineage. Yes, if it is husband and wife, we need to know clearly whose child is this, where do they belong and so on. May the Almighty help us to fulfill the rights of our parents. And then you have the Sharia coming to protect the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects your wealth. So anything to do with usurping your wealth and mine will be prohibited. No stealing and no cheating, deceiving the business ethics and everything come into play. Interest makes the rich richer and the poor poorer prohibited. Anything that is detrimental to you, the Almighty knows about it. He prohibits it. This is the Sharia. It will protect your wealth fairly. At the same time, it protects your dignity. The Sharia has come to protect your dignity. People who want to accuse you of adultery, they need to be dealt with. People who want to swipe at you, defame you, they will be dealt with. And the Sharia comes to protect faith and religion. Nobody forces you to enter the fold of Islam. You enter it on your own. The Sharia comes to protect faith. You have freedom of religion. In Islam, we believe you have your faith, I have mine. You're different, I'm different. You follow, I follow. Don't trample, I won't trample. Amazing. That's the law. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So this is the sharia. It's not barbaric. I'd like to pause on one point. You see the cutting of the hand. People say, well, if they steal, they cut hands. So it's very barbaric. Let me tell you, it's not like that. The Sharia, a lot of the laws are deterrent, very much deterrent than a penalty, penalization. Because if a person steals, they need to have stolen from a specific place, a spe more than a specific amount. They need to be sane and witnesses need to have witnessed what they did. And thereafter, if all these rules or if all these conditions have been met, the judge may decide what to do with that person the highest penalty would be to, to cut the right hand at the wrist. That's Sharia. Allah knows why that will happen. But in a lot of cases, it doesn't get right to the highest point because there is something within the conditions that may not be met 100%. I can give you an example of the stoning to death. People say, wow, barbaric. To this day, I don't know of a single case. Reality of a person who's been stoned to death by witnesses with the conditions. If anything has ever happened in Islamic history, it's because of confession and reiteration of that confession throughout. Because there is a difference. If one confesses and if one is nabbed, for example, you need four brilliant Muslim men who are who pray their prayers and who are dedicated Muslims to have witnessed the act of adultery. It has not happened. Because at the same time, Islam teaches you, when you see something bad, look down. So imagine four bearded guys, you know, who are sitting in the front of the mosque saying, we saw this woman and we saw this man and we saw and we all went and I said, come, come, come. see." This. So to be honest with you, it's more of a deterrent than anything else. Allah gives you time. He is showing you how bad. He's showing you how bad it is. It's a crime. And if you've committed it, you have the door of repentance. You repent and I've given you the conditions of that. And this is what Islam says. So it's teaching you purity, chastity, cleanliness, morality. And this is why we say, when you cover your body, my sisters, do you know what happens? You are appreciated and valued in the true sense. 
you don't have to be enslaved by the male eye so you walk and you're just the sex tool and you're just this point of attraction everyone looks at you wow and when you become a mother they don't look at you anymore but subhanallah if you were dressed appropriately then men would get along with their business and so would you and you know what Mac and everyone else would go bust Allahu Akbar May Allah grant us the nur. May Allah grant us the light that he gives on our skins. And I tell people, you know what? Allah gives you nur. Allah gives you a light that shines on your skin. Why do you mac it up? It's a fact. You're blocking it. You're closing it. You're burning your skin such that when you wash it off, you look at yourself without makeup and you say, oh, I can't even see my husband anymore. <laughs> Allah protect us. You have a beauty. That needs to be appreciated internally and externally. Allah gives you a light that shines from your face on your skin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beautify our sisters. So imagine if, if the, all women, just say a scenario, Sharia implemented, for example, and all women were dressed in a specific way, modestly. What would a man have to compare? When he gets married, whoa, that's his queen. Because when he looks left, someone is covered. He looks right, someone is covered. So he's so happy with what he has because he doesn't compare. But the reality is you married. You married your wife for her legs. Wow. And guess what happened? You went to the mall and saw better legs. So you come home and you're upset and you're busy on your phone. Who are you tweeting? Trying to find out who was that? Why I need those legs. <laughs> You'd rather go and have chicken legs from the closest halal restaurant. That's better for you. Allahu Akbar. My brothers and sisters, do you see the logic? So if you are covered, you are appreciated by who's supposed to appreciate you. Not the rest of the world. Marriages are breaking because of this. If a person has married you because you displayed a figure in public, remember my sister, there are a thousand others who will have a better figure even if yours was Miss World. At one stage, there is something known as Miss Universe. You need to know that. So it doesn't stop. Allah says, don't follow the rat race and become a mouse or one of the mice. No, what you need to do is cover yourself decently, modestly, so that the male can appreciate you. And he, he really won't have much to compare you with. And you are the queen because when he looks, as I said, left or right, he sees covered up women. And that's what it is. This is the beauty of the Sharia. But people don't understand. No, it is barbaric. You know, you are actually uh, blocking this woman. To be believe me, if you take a careful look at it, it is liberation. It liberates you. It makes you independent of the male. It makes you independent. You are yourself and you are judged based on what your heart is all about. The sacrifice you've made at home, the love that you show and you have a family that is so happy. We have lost values today. Look at the world. It's screaming and crying sometimes because we as Muslims have stopped dressing the way we're supposed to. Then we worried. But you know what? He's a womanizer. My sister, where did you meet him? What happened? How did you meet? It's interesting. Be honest and you'll find out that you know what? Well, he liked the way head and shoulders looked on my hair. <laughs> now that you were preg you know, you had delivered after pregnancy and so on. And you know, you might have lost a little bit of hair and things happen and you might be still working on it. Well, head and shoulders works on somebody else's hair. Allahu Akbar. Is that what a woman is all about? Just to look at and to say, I want that one and this one. No, a woman is to be respected. This is what Islam says. So if the world is portraying it differently and says, that you know what? This is barbaric and wallahi, we look at it differently. And we say, my sisters, I'm sure those who are in hijab today, I don't think anyone's forcing you to do that. And this is something the West has misunderstood. People think we're forcing, no force. If anyone is forcing, wallahi, to be honest with you, in this particular country, it's a free country. It's one of the most free countries. The freedom extends beyond what I would even term freedom. Subhanallah. So we are so free, so free. And you're trying to tell me that people are being forced. And yet there are so many people who covered from head to toe in this country. Allahu Akbar. They know the feeling of that liberation they have within. Unmatched. You need to first feel it. You need to know it. Once you have it, you will not trade it for anything else. Amazing. So in a nutshell, this is Islam. Obviously, we've only spoken of a few aspects of it. I haven't looked at the clock yet. It says one hour and nine minutes and 21 seconds. But amazing. I've touched on just a few aspects. What is Islam all about? 
you will still have to go and research much deeper and deeper. Remember, Islam is a knowledge-based religion. The more you know, the more you will love it. You need to know the pure faith. The less you know, don't blame anyone but yourself if you were to turn away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify us, grant us goodness, make us from those who can develop their character and conduct. In fact, a point comes to my mind before I close. Extremely important point. What is halal? I'm sure we need to know. People say, wow, these people chant their magical slogans on the meat. So when we eat it, we want to be Muslims. That's not true. I've heard that in Africa. They say these people chant their witchcraft on all our animals. So why should we eat halal? That is the most foolish statement I've ever heard. All the creatures have been given life by the Almighty. Who is the giver of life? The Almighty. What gives me the right to take the life of a cow away? I don't have the right. So the Almighty says, well, under certain conditions, you may be granted permission to take that life away in a specific way. What is that? If you really would like to eat consumption, certain animals we've made for consumption. So I am not allowed to destroy the creatures of the Almighty for no purpose. I cannot even destroy the ecosystem without purpose. If I want to cut trees down, I need to ask myself, why am I doing it? If there's no purpose for it, leave the tree. It has life of a different nature. You're a Muslim. You need to be at peace with, the, with everything else. But yes, if there is a need for firewood or there is a need to clear the path, I may say in the name of the Almighty, the giver of the life, and I begin to cut that tree. So what about insects? Before you spray your mosquito repellent, mosquito, mosquito, well, if it's making that little sound, irritating sound, I'm talking of Africa, I don't know about here, but I'm sure you get mosquitoes here. That little sound that irritates you, before you spray your doom, you say in the name of the Almighty, Bismillah, you spray your doom. What happened? They were doomed. But that was for, for a purpose. You don't just go and destroy. If a reptile is harming you, 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 you may, by the name of the Almighty. You, you need to take his name because he's the giver of that life. Who are you to take it away? So when it comes to the animals, there are certain animals that are permissible to eat. You cannot just be barbaric. The way you have treated the animal from the point of its birth to the point of its slaughter is extremely important. You need to be completely humane even with animals. You need to treat them Give them that life that they deserve. Feed them properly. Give them that air and the space. If you were to look at abattoirs that belong to non-Muslims, they are very barbarically run. To be honest with you, I've visited. I've seen. We are so shocked, nauseating. And people say, yeah, you guys are doing something that's very barbaric. Oh, come and see. We'll show you. Show you how it's done. Come. So now when we get to the, the cow, for example, or the sheep, that has been fed properly and it has not been force fed and kept in a pen like the ducks of the world and the chickens that don't even grow feathers anymore because they are modified their sole purpose of being given life is to grow until they are killed brutally in order to be served on the table not halal we don't want that it must be accorded its life it must be treated as a proper chicken it must be treated as an animal a bird whatever it is it must be fed properly and at the same time you bring it to the pen you slaughter it in a way that it does not witness the others. And at the same time, such a sharp blade. And why is it that the throat is used? Because of the central nervous system. Powerful statement. Sometimes people hack these animals to death. People say, you need to stun these animals. Did you know that there is research that proves that stunning an animal actually creates greater pain than if you don't stun the animal? People say, how? Go and check. You're confusing the animal totally. You're killing it unconscious. What are you talking about? Amazing. If you were to get cut with a blade as you're shaving, you won't even know that you're cut until water goes on it. Why? The razor was very sharp, very sharp. So we are to use a sharp blade, quick slice. When I burn my fingers, what happens? A message goes from the sensory nerves to my brain, central nervous system, that you know what, something has happened here. The brain comes back and the message goes through the bloodstream, central nervous system. It says, you are hurt, lift your hand up. And I do this. It happens within a split second. But if the central nervous system is ruptured from the jugulars, the pain, the, the message goes up, it gets stuck there because it cannot go up anymore. Blood system, bloodstream, out. So what happens? 
it numbs to a halt. There you are. That is halal. If you were to slice it, the message will not go from the bottom to the top, nor from the top to the bottom, because the jugulars are gone. Wind pipe and food pipe. And you have to take the permission of the giver of that life when you are slaughtering it. If not, we don't want to eat that. You have stolen it from the property of God. Allahu Akbar. How can you just cut an animal? Who are you? Who are you to take that life away? You need to say, in the name of the giver of the life here, I'm taking this by your permission. Such a humane way, beautiful. That is termed halal. You are taking the life away. And this is the original system of the Jews and the Christians. It is the original system that was taught by all the messengers. Islam adopts it quite strictly and so does Judaism. And I'd like to think Judaism adopts it even more strictly. Go and study, you will find it. Same system. So why do people pick on halal? It in fact is the most humane way. In fact, it is the way of being protected from horse meat. Allah protect us, yes. And the supervisors will ensure that things are happening. They will tell you, we guarantee you that this thing was done properly. And guess what? It's not a horse, my brother. Amazing. That is halal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant my explanation, the understanding in your minds. It is a privilege and honor to eat something that was slaughtered by the name of the giver of the life. To say, only for eating purposes, consumption, we took into consideration every rule that you have put. And we have actually fulfilled everything. So we hope we will now get the blessing of the food that we put into our mouth. If not, I'd rather eat the vegetables. May Allah protect us. Really. My brothers and sisters, it has really been an honor to be here this evening. I hope and I pray the few words I have said have been very educational and have given you a better picture of what Islam is. And as I said, you continue swimming. Knowledge is an ocean that has no coast. So continue swimming, inshallah, until you meet your maker. May the Almighty have mercy upon myself and yourselves and entire creation. And may we live in a happier world, a globe that sees peace and tolerance, a globe that sees justice, a globe that sees alleviation of suffering, a globe that sees humanitarianism, and a globe that sees us all reaching out to one another. And until we meet again on any other occasion, if not in paradise, we say, Sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad, Subhanallahu bihamdih, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk, Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر ما شاء الله ما شاء الله I would like to thank our esteemed guest Mufti Ismail Mank for his profound and highly inspirational messages in his usual charismatic humorous and engaging style Subhanallah my dear brothers and sisters you are about to come to the end of our program today inshallah now the final messages let's ponder and reflect and try to understand the messages shared with us by our keynote speakers today let us realize the purpose of our life, my brothers and sisters. Let us reconnect and revive the bond of, with our Creator, inshallah.